So maybe maybe uh, your take on the future of meta heuristics in general in bio inspired algorithms. What's the role of uh, those algorithms in you know in academia and also in industry? If uh, you know of uh, many uh, real world problems sure. that are being tackled with GAs yeah. and where we are succeeding, where we are failing, and why? You know? Yeah. So yeah. So I always it always seemed to me that. Um, uh, meta heuristics, uh, genetic algorithms, evolutionary computation, you know, swarm, whatever, your favorite flavor, um, we're having an impact in industry. And so if you look under the hood of a lot of companies, you'll see meta heuristics all over the place. So for example, um, um, the uh, company in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts that does market research using evolution, distributed ev evolutionary computation and uses the evolutionary computation to generate new product ideas. Um, um, and you have, then you have uh, you know, fairly old efforts starting at General Electric to use genetic algorithms and evolutionary computation and design and companies that embed that in software that's readily available and, and creating jobs. And um, so you have companies like Ingenious Systems and uh, and uh, Estico in, in Italy that have have software that's all you know essentially based on genetic algorithms. Um, Estico uses um, a multi-objective a multi-objective GA to um, uh, as part of their software system, and it's quite popular in design circles with companies all over the world. So uh, the uh, in many ways. Um, these kind, this kind of AI or computational AI has made it into the marketplace in many ways more than the toy AI that, that where AI came from. So people, people solve toy problems. Um, um, uh, John Koza likes to talk about the A to I ratio uh, of, of something, things that are overly artificial and not very intelligent. Um, um, and so it seems seems to me that computational intelligence has had an impact, continues continues to have an impact, and uh, and that impact will grow. It's not always the case that people brag about it or make it into a product feature. So, mm -hmm. for example, sometimes people can get nervous uh, um, if you're uh, um, uh, if if you have if if you're um, if you have strong views about uh, 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 God and the nature of evolution, then you might not like evolutionary computation and you might have problems with that. <laughs> so from a marketing point of view, people don't always put these things on the front of what they're doing, but yeah. under the hood, it's there. Yes. And, and in a lot of countries, it's spread quite a lot. There's no bias against using these things in, say, Japan or in Asia or even in Europe. It's somehow, there's a in, in, uh, in my country, there seems to be a bit of a bias against meta heuristics because they're not proven. Mm -hmm. um, you can't prove global convergence and in, yeah. in, th in this time or that time. But so so I, I see an analogy, a kind of analogy you're making uh, about a cultural uh, mindset that uh, is based against like uh, yes. Darwinian evolution and uh, its role on explained biological evolution. You, you, so what you're saying basically is that it might be another bias in industry uh, regarding metheuristics uh, concerning that you you can't prove that they work and then people are you know maybe afraid of using them for yeah. pretty much the same reasons. Well, so if you think about you know you think about the hu the heuristic algorithm distinction that's sometimes made in in computer science. Um, so that's a distinction that puts a sharp focus on those things that can be proven mm -hmm. to work versus those things that may just work in some sense. Yeah. Um, and um, and I've often puzzled about that. So we don't make the same distinction when it comes to machines. Yes. So for example, um, for example, an airplane. Mm -hmm. Nobody has ever proven that an airplane can fly in a yeah. mathematically rigorous way. Yes. But we all entrust our lives to them, yeah. uh, or many of us do. Some people are afraid to fly and maybe have doubts about flight. But most of us get on an airplane without a second thought, even though there's no formal there's no formal proof of convergence for an airplane. Yeah. And so, um, so it seems to me that it's, it's a little bit interesting. Why, um, why for a material machine like an airplane don't we uh, uh, an airplane or a toaster? 
there's no formal proof that a toaster can toast bread. <laughs> um, and yet, when we go to the conceptual realm, all of a sudden, this becomes, it seems to become important. Well, it's a cultural importance. It's not a pragmatic importance. Because again, we entrust our lives to machines that have no proof of convergence. Now, there's lots of mathematics, and there's lots of physics that, talk to, that speaks to airplanes and toasters. Um, but we don't demand rigorous proofs of convergence. We, we demand a certain uh, degree of uh, proof of reliability in the, in the domain of use mm -hmm. of a certain machine. And we, and we want to bound the performance and we want to understand that, that an airplane will lift a certain amount of load in a certain crosswind under certain circumstances. So why is it that we don't do the same thing for um, meta heuristics? Why don't, we, why don't we have testing procedures for meta heuristics that are more, more similar mm -hmm. to those that we use for airplanes and toasters? Yeah. Um, and so I, I've made the distinction between conceptual machines and material machines, and it seems like there's a cultural bias that changes the rules of design for conceptual machines, and I, I just think that the I think that that change is sort of specious. I think it's a kind of um, uh, it's a kind of mathematical snobbery or uh, elevation of mathematics to the extent mm. of functionality yeah. and, and pragmatics. And uh, if at the end of the day, what we care about is the functioning of the proper functioning of the thing to, to serve human beings, it shouldn't matter whether something is proven to work, as long as we sort of, we understand in some, in some way that the thing works in the intended domain. Okay, so uh, uh, to end up, uh, given that we um, have the cultural meanings to deal with that, yeah. to deal with uh, things that are not provable, sure. but uh, still works, you think the role of metaphysics is, is gonna increase or, or you know, it may eventually be replaced by uh, new methods and, uh, in the next 10 or 20 years. Hmm. Yeah, so I think, I, think the, the, um, I think we'll continue, if we do the right kind of theory on metaheuristics, we'll, we'll find the kind, you know, so the kind of theory that I did on genetic algorithms when I was in that business sort of helped us understand the scaling behavior I was very interested in scaling laws for mm -hmm. for genetic algorithms and meta heuristics. I think under, so it doesn't mean that we don't need conceptual understanding of these things. It's just that the looking for formal proofs of convergence is looking. It's like the old country western song. It's looking for love in all the wrong places. We need yeah. to look in the right places for the kind of thing that we need. I but I think um, I think there's a greater challenge that is actually goes beyond pragmatics, and and. And, uh, and, and this may be useful for your, your, um, uh, for your debates and so forth. And that is, um, there's a certain sense in, in which, um, you know, as I, as I was winding down my lab, I was reflecting on, um, oh, things like the Turing test and things like the Chinese room problem mm -hmm. and some of these challenges to AI and what AI was about. And I, and I got to the point of wondering if, there, there was a sense in which I thought John Searle was profoundly wrong okay. in the Chinese room, and then I thought there was a sense in which he was profoundly right. In the, and it's the following. I think, you know, we've spent so much time on these algorithms that you know, we have inputs and outputs. And, and um, but I think that his objection, in a certain sense, had to do with the philosophical ideas of in, intentionality and consciousness mm -hmm. and so when we do these out al when we do algorithms like this or we create say we create a robotic robot that's got some sort of genetic algorithm to do some path planning or something oh. I think I think Searle's right that essentially it's like a it's like a person sitting in a room holding up a Chinese looking at the Chinese character and holding up another character there's a sense in which the there's no one home there's that there's no one there's no intentional being mm -hmm. And I think the challenge of intentionality, in the, and at a low level, like at the level of a the intentionality that a uh, an, a social insect might have, and then the intentionality that a mammal might have, and then and then the consciousness that a human being might have. It seems to me that those are interesting computational challenges that then might show us a way 
to things that are truly more autonomous. Because we really are trying to move these systems into things that actually can can think, but there's no one thinking. It's sort it is sort of like holding up a card. It is sort of there there is no one home. But I think I don't think Searle's right that those that those things can't be tackled mm -hmm. by computational means. I don't think that there's a limit to computational systems um, that prevents things like intentionality and consciousness from being embedded in a computational system. But it seems to me that there's a certain kind of uh, con control system structure, a certain amount of complexity and feedback that's needed. And, and so I, I, was, I was fascinated by questions of what would a minimally conscious automaton be? Or what would a minimally well, intentional uh, what are the minimum computational, and so what, what are sort of the minimum conditions, what kind of feedback yeah. and complexity do you need before something starts to exhibit something like intentional behavior? And, and um, I don't think those are easy questions, but it seems like they're worthy questions, and it seems to me that it's the kind of question that should challenge people who are interested in metaheuristics are often practical. And they often come with a background from electrical engineering, control engineering, and other kinds of other kinds of systems engineering. And it seems to me that there's a there's a deeply um, interesting philosophical and practical problem kind of wrapped in those questions um, that that people with the kind of background that come to meta heuristics and computational intelligence might be interested in. So I sort of you know leave you with I and and I. I asked the question. I'm not saying I've got great answers, but I, but it seems to me that it's it's a it's a good kind of question to challenge the field to do something that's qualitatively very different from what we've done to this point. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much. You bet. My pleasure.